I'm Ronnie Sasaki, and if you're new here, I am not one of the pastors of our church. But I am a, I'm a member of the worship team over at the Main Street campus, and I am blessed and honored today to be sharing with you. As soon as I was asked to speak here, I immediately went out and got my first tattoo so that I would fit in up here on the stage. <laughs> Just to give you a little bit of trivia about myself, my grandpa was a Baptist preacher his entire career. And when he passed away, he was the interim pastor over at the Main Street Church. He preached on Sunday morning, went home and took a nap and died in his sleep. Now I'd like to believe that he would be very happy that I'm here today. He would not be as happy about the tattoo, I'm afraid. <laughs> So, shh. <laughs> we just won't tell him about that, okay? I like to believe that his legacy lives on in me. And guess what? The legacy of the church lives on in you. I think that is so cool. We've been in a series throughout the month of August that Danny has named One Crowded Hour. And so today I'd like us to take a look at One Crowded Hour, displaying the works of God. We have a beautiful example of this when Jesus heals the blind man in John chapter 9, but before he heals him, the disciples stop and they ask Jesus a question. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. I wonder if when that child was born and his parents realized that he was blind, if they felt somehow that they were being punished. If they wondered, what did we do wrong? Why are we cursed? And I'm sure they must have been completely distraught when they realized that the fate of their child was probably going to be sitting on the sidewalk holding a cardboard sign, relying on everybody that walked by every day to provide all of his food and his sustenance and every need that he possibly had. And then what about the guy himself? Do you suppose as he sat there every single day, he wondered what he had done wrong to deserve such a life? Why did God choose to punish him? Do you think maybe they would have seen it differently had they known from the very beginning that one day Jesus was going to come walking down the street and he was going to stop and he was going to heal this blind man. And then forevermore, we were going to read his story in the Bible, the number one New York Times best-selling book for all time, Right? And then his story was going to be remembered for thousands and thousands of years. I wonder if they had, would have looked at his blindness any different had they known that the works of Jesus Christ were going to be displayed in such a way that he would be known throughout history. I love the story about the blind man because I kind of can relate to it just a little bit. You see, when I was born, they brought me into the world and realized that I was absolutely perfect. Now, I've always wondered what makes a child perfect in its parents' eyes. One day I was at church and I was walking out in the foyer during the service and I heard a baby crying and it sounded like a pretty young baby and so I thought, oh, I want to go see if it's a newborn. And I walk over and his dad was holding this child who definitely was really young. And so I asked him and he's answering questions and he's just beaming and he says, he's just perfect. His nose is just right. His ears are tucked into his head just so. And he's got all 10 fingers and all 10 toes. He's just perfect. And when I was born, yes, they noticed immediately I had all 10 fingers and 10 toes. So I was perfect. And then shortly after that, they realized that something was wrong with my right leg. It looked like it was jammed together and perhaps still in the fetal position. So they brought in an orthopedic specialist who looked at me and declared to my parents, yes, your daughter has a birth defect. And he went on to say that I would probably never even walk. Now, I was born in 1964, and, you know, that really wasn't the dark ages. So to make such a declaration that I never would walk, I thought it's somewhat ridiculous looking back. My parents, not knowing what else to do, they were barely older than kids themselves. They took me home, 
And they didn't have an owner's manual or anything like that. that you know, those don't come with kids, right? So they began just to treat me like any other child. And thank you to Shriners Hospital and Modern Prosthetics. And I always laugh at Modern Prosthetics when I show this picture. It's kind of an old photo, but you can see that that leg, it looks pretty um, primitive, right? There's like these two wood bars. It's got like a crutch tip on the end. But that was the first leg that I learned to walk on. So by the time I was two, I was walking. And I'm glad to say that learning to walk was never one of the struggles that I had. What I struggled with most was learning to love and accept myself. Because as a child growing up, I hated being different. I hated being the one who was stared at. I hated being the one that was teased. I wanted to fit in with all the other kids. I wanted to look like them. And I certainly wanted to be able to run and play just exactly like they were. And so I began to ask the why questions. Why me? Why out of all the kids in the world was I the one who only has one leg? Why am I being punished? Am I being cursed? Is this leg going to ruin my life? You see, I had this secret dream as a kid. And it was one of those dreams that I held way down deep inside. Have you ever had one of those? It's so kind of out there, ridiculous and crazy. And you know in your heart that it's probably never going to happen, right? So you don't tell your friends. Because you know if you do, they're going to just laugh at you. And you certainly don't tell your parents. Because your mom is going to say something like this. Can you make a living doing that? <laughs> I confess, I have said this to my own kids a time or two. Usually it's to my son in relation to becoming a professional video game player. <sighs> One day I was speaking for a group, and a gentleman came up to me afterwards, and he said, you know, my son is a professional video game player. <laughs> so news to all of us, right? You can make a living <laughs> doing that. But I held the dream deep inside to become an Olympic athlete. Now, talk about a crazy dream for a one-legged girl to have, being an Olympic athlete. Um, I just knew, no way, it's ever going to happen. And it just added to the struggles that I had to prove myself, to prove my worth, and to prove my value. My introduction to sports came in PE in school. Maybe you remember what it was like. The teacher would pick two team captains, and they were always the most popular kids at school. And the reason they were the most popular kids is because they were the best athletes. And they would put them up in front of all the rest of us, and they would begin to pick off their teams. And the first one would go, I want you. And then the second one, I want you. And the next, I want you. And then I want you. And they would begin to pick off the very best athletes in the school as they got down to the less good athletes and less good athletes until eventually there were only a few of us remaining. And finally, I guess just to save us a little bit of dignity, the teacher would assign us to a team. And I remember walking over to my team. And I could see the look in their faces as they were now recalculating their chances of winning or losing because, oh, no, we've got the one-legged girl on our team. We had this thing called the President's Physical Fitness Award. And it was a battery of tests that you went through. And if you passed all of the tests, and there were things like doing so many sit-ups in a certain amount of time, had to hang from a bar for a certain period of time. I think we had to climb a rope. Now, of all of the skills we learned in school, I think climbing a rope is probably something really important to know how to do. We also had to run and, and a mile and get it within a certain period of time and do sprints. And there was just a whole bunch of things. And if you passed them all, you were granted the President's Physical Fitness Award. And I really wanted one of these awards. Because on the last day of school, the principal would have an assembly. And everybody that passed was given a certificate with a patch. And all of the cool kids in my school had one of those patches. They sewed it on their jackets. And throughout the summer, you'd see these kids with this patch sewn on their jacket or their sweatshirt. And if they were really cool, they didn't just have one patch. They had like two or three. And I didn't think this was fair because I just knew that if I had two legs, I would have been able to pass that test and I would have one of those patches. And so I decided to do what I thought would solve the problem. And since it was called the President's Physical Fitness Award, I wrote a letter to the President of the United States, <laughs> thinking, surely this man can help me. 
And I don't have a copy of the letter that I wrote to him. I do have a copy of the letter that was sent back to me. But my plea was, can you please design criteria for a kid with one leg like me so that I can pass this test and get this award? Now, the letter I got back um, was not from the President of the United States, as you might imagine. But here's how it went. Dear Ronnie, I have been asked to acknowledge your recent letter. Your comments on the physical fitness test have been read with interest, and I know the president would want me to thank you for making your views known to us. Yes, I bet that president was so happy. It was Gerald Ford at the time, <laughs> probably utmost in his mind. We recognize that not all boys and girls have an equal opportunity to win the Presidential Physical Fitness Award. Our problem is in attempting to develop a set of standards that would apply equally to a tremendous variety of handicapped persons. I am sure you understand that we cannot simply give the award to every boy or girl who has a physical handicap. On the other hand, it is almost impossible to devise appropriate standards. A child who is blind has one problem, a child who is deaf has another, and a child with cerebral palsy yet another. The list goes on and on. I am afraid my answer is not very satisfactory, but I hope it will give you a better understanding of the problems we are confronted with in attempting to administer the award pro program. Sincerely, a guy named V.L. Nicholson. Now, my mother, I have a wonderful mother. She says to me, oh, Ronnie, <laughs> that letter, this is not the original letter, by the way. I had to make the font really large so that I could read it. <laughs> oh, Ronnie, that letter is so special. That is better than any patch. Think about it. You can hold it up to the light, and you can see the eagle embossed in the paper. That letter is way better than a patch. My mom did not get it at all. I could not sew a stupid letter to my jacket and wear it around the school for everybody to see that I had value and that I had worth and that I fit in with them. She just didn't understand that I was looking for some kind of outward confirmation to confirm the worth that I didn't realize at the time came from Jesus Christ. I always used to walk for exercise, and I still do. It's one of my preferred things to do. And um, it's not uncommon if I'm out walking for a car to pull over to the side of the road and say, hey, do you need a ride? Now, I'm out trucking along with my running shorts, running shoes, heart monitor, you know, booking, and these people stop and ask if I need a ride. Don't they realize I'm out getting exercise? I mean, can you imagine driving out of here today and you see a runner going up on the sidewalk and you pull up and you go, hey, dude, you need a ride? You wouldn't do that. So I ask when this happens, do I look like I need a ride? Well, um, yes, as a matter of fact, you do. <laughs> So you can see that becoming an Olympic athlete was really not a very plausible thing to happen. <laughs> By the time I reached junior high, I had to put my um, athletic aspirations on hold because by then I was feeling so sorry for myself and I was so defeated. And junior high level, all of a sudden, every single flaw that I saw in myself was magnified like a thousand percent. Do you remember that time in your life? And I just hated the way that I walked. Now I have news for you. I feel like I walk like a runway model. I don't feel like I limp at all. And then I see a video, and it's so cool nowadays that every phone is equipped with a video camera, so they just abound all over the world. And I'm sure after today, I'll see myself walking on video again, and I'll go, oh my goodness. I could live without ever watching that. My leg caused lumps and bumps in all the wrong places so that all the jeans that the other girls were wearing didn't quite fit me. I wore blousy clothes and tried to hide this thing that I considered to be such a terrible flaw. I knew nobody was going to want to be my friend because, after all, I was the handicapped kid. And I was convinced at that point in time that my leg was ruining my life. So rather than write a letter to the president, what I did to solve this dilemma was every single night when I went to bed, I cried myself to sleep. And I cried out to God those words, why have you cursed me? 
Why do I have to deal with this? Why am I dealing with all of this loneliness and feeling like I'm an outcast? Jesus, why me? He must have got really sick and tired of listening to me whine. Because one night I felt his presence in my room like no other time I've ever experienced. Have you ever been there where all of a sudden you know that Jesus is right there in the room with you, in the car with you, wherever you happen to be, and he's just right there. And you can hear his voice as if he were speaking audibly to you. That is the way I felt that night. I don't know how many nights in a row I'd been doing this, same old thing. And he walks up and sits down on the edge of my bed, just like my mother would have, took my hair behind my ear, and he says to me, Ronnie, why are you crying? Don't you know I made you the way that you are for a reason? Don't you know that I've got this plan for your life? I've laid it out beautifully. And I needed a one-legged girl to live out this life. So I chose you. Trust me. Trust me. I've got big plans for you. I am going to use you. And I need you to have one leg. You see, when I was a little kid, I used to pray to be healed. I'd kneel beside my bed, fold my hands, and pray, Dear Jesus, please, please, please heal me. Take away my leg. Replace it with one that's real, that has real bones and real skin. And I would squeeze my eyes so tight together, knowing that if I just prayed hard enough, that I'd open my eyes and, woo, there it would be, a brand new leg. And then when it didn't happen, I thought, okay, it, it's going to take God just a little bit of time to make this happen. So I'm going to go to sleep. And when I wake up in the morning, I'm sure that I'll have a new leg. So I'd wake up in the morning and look down, and lo and behold, it was the same. Because you see, healing looks different oftentimes than we think it should. And that night in my bedroom, God healed me. I did not grow a new leg. He healed my heart. He, he taught me and showed me that I could trust him with my life. And I remember saying at that time, well, okay, God, if you want to use a one-legged girl, go right ahead. Shortly after that, I discovered this passage in the Bible. It's one of my favorites, and I believe that it was written just for me. Well, maybe it was written for the blind guy, too. And you know what? I'm willing to share it with each one of you. Psalms 139, 13 through 16 goes like this. For you form my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows this very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. I like to picture... A couple things from this passage. The first one is that God is, he's up in heaven, right? He's planning out the whole universe or whatever you would want to call it, right? The whole world, forever. And he plans out this life, every single day of this life. And he thinks to himself, okay, in order for this to happen, I got to find a girl with one leg. Who am I going to choose? And for some reason, he chose me. Same for you. Before you were ever even born, before you were ever even thought of, God sat up in heaven and he, he planned out this life. And he says, now who do I choose to fit into here? And he chose you. The other thing I love about this verse is the picture of God weaving us together. If you've ever seen a loom of a master craftsman weaver, they have all the strands that go this way. And then one by one, they began to weave in the colors. 
and the textures. And at first, it doesn't look like hardly anything. You can't hardly even tell what it is. And you might look at it and say, whoa, that's a work of art? Are you kidding me? But in the mind of the craftsman, they don't see just some strands going this way and a few strands going this way. They see the entire finished work of art. They see it hanging on the wall, this priceless piece. And they know how each strand has to go in and when it has to go in and how it has to lay so that upon completion, this priceless masterpiece can be displayed for all. And I love to see Jesus looking at my life in that very way. When I changed my belief system around my leg, and I realized that I was not being cursed by God, that I was actually being blessed, chosen by God to be the way that he created me to be, my life changed. In the same way that that blind man met Jesus on the side of the road, and God's works were displayed in him, his life changed forever. Shortly after that, I received a phone call from a woman. Her name was Jan, and she said to me on the phone, Ronnie, would you like to learn how to ski? Now, I'd wanted to learn how to ski for a long time. I'd seen some pretty famous one-legged skiers on television, so I knew it could be done, but we could not find a teacher to teach me. So my parents and I, we made several different phone calls to ski areas and looking for somebody that could possibly teach me how to ski. There was a couple reasons that I wanted to learn. One of them was I thought I'd be good at it. I thought, finally, maybe this is something I could be really good at in sports. But the other reason that I wanted to learn how to ski is because all of the cool kids in my school were skiers. And every Friday we had a ski club, and they would bring all of their gear, and the halls would be lined with all of this stuff that did not fit into the lockers. And they wore their ski jackets around all day long. And I mean, it didn't matter how warm the school was. Boy, they had those ski jackets on. So everybody knew that they were in the ski club and they were going to be off. You could hear them coming down the hall because you know how that material is kind of slippery and they, they slide their arms. They go, like, <laughs> sound is their arms as they're strutting down the hall. And you could hear the jangling of those lift tickets on their zipper. And that made them really cool. Now, when I tell this to youngsters nowadays, they kind of don't, they look at me with this really blank stare because they don't know what I'm talking about when I say lift ticket. Because nowadays, when you go skiing, your lift ticket is just a little piece of paper that you slide into your pocket and it's read electronically. But back in the olden days, we had lift tickets that hung on what was called a wire wicket. It's a piece of wire, kind of shaped like a U, then you strung that thing through the hole in your zipper and you stuck the tape ticket onto that wire wicket. Now to be really cool, it was kind of like the patches, not just one lift ticket. You had to have like 20 of those things hanging from your zipper. So that when you walk, this jangling noise, jangle, 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 jangle. I mean, nobody would dare ever cut those things off because you would lose major cool points. So I thought to myself when I hung up the phone, yay, <laughs> I'm gonna get a lift ticket. Finally, I can't wait to go to school Monday morning. I'm going to wear my ski jacket, and I'm going to have that, that lift ticket. It may be only one, so I'm going to have to really flip it around there to try to get it to jangle. <laughs> so I met up with Jan. We got me fitted with all the equipment that I was going to need, and we went up to the mountain. And I said to her, yay, when do I get my lift ticket? And she says, Ronnie, we're not going to get a lift ticket today. My heart just sank. I was devastated. And she says, what we're going to do today is learn how to fall down. <laughs> huh. Whoa. That is not what I envisioned. What am I going to do Monday? Go to school and tell everybody I learned how to fall down? I think I'm a pretty good faller. I'm an expert at falling, and people are always trying to teach me how to do it. I pace back and forth on the stage here, and I keep looking at this thing right here. Going. I better steer clear of that because it would be so like me to hook this leg on that thing and just boop, flop right down. One day I was singing in the choir at church and we were wearing robes. This was a long time ago, right? And I went to step up and I caught my heel in the back of the robe. And not only did I fall, I took the entire front row out with me. <laughs> it was like dominoes. And um, a while later, I got out of bed one morning, and, and I don't wear my artificial leg when I go to bed, and just as I 
went to put my leg on the floor, I got this terrible cramp in my calf. So when I put my weight on the leg, it buckled underneath me and I crashed to the ground, fell on my thumb and I sprained my thumb. So my thumb is throbbing, my leg is still cramping and I'm rolling around there, probably making some kind of weird animal noises. And I must have woken up my husband who was sleeping because the next thing I know is I'm laying on my back looking up I see his face appear over the edge of the bed. <laughs> and he's looking down at me. This is, this is the truth. He says, what happened? <laughs> Did you forget you only had one leg or something? <laughs> to which I did not reply, just so you know. And in my silence, he must have took that as an invitation for a teaching moment. Men. I love you all, and your ability to solve problems and fix everything is really important to us all, right? So he says to me, because he's a martial arts instructor, and he has a lot of experience in this area, he goes, you know what your problem is, Ronnie? If you would learn how to fall, then you wouldn't get hurt when these kinds of things happen. He says, what you need to do is come to one of my classes or a couple of my classes, and I'll teach you how to kind of tuck and roll. So the next time you fall out of bed, you can just tuck and roll, and you won't get hurt. I am so grateful for him telling me that that day. <laughs> and I get up at the ski area, and here's Jan telling me I'm going to learn how to fall. And I'm really glad that she did that because of out of everything else I worked on that day, it was the only thing I perfected. I could not make one link turn to save my life. I would get up and fall down. I'm practicing. Get up, fall back down. I'm practicing again. And by the end of the day, I had perfected that. And I remember sitting on the ground, struggling to push myself back up because by then I was really tired. And these little kids, they just go zooming by. And they'd see me laying on the ground. Now, usually if, if a kid sees me in a grocery store or something, and they notice that I have a, a funny leg, as they like to call it, they, they blurt out, Mommy, Mommy, look at the lady with the funny leg. And the mother, you know, she's horrified, right? She's grabbing that kid, yanking him away before I can hear it. Now, here's the deal, you guys. I have one leg. My ears are fine. <laughs> and I can hear those kids as the mother is dragging them away. Wait, wait, Mommy! Look at her, look at her, look at her leg. On that day when I'm sitting in the snow, it was the same kind of a deal, but it was so funny because they go skim by and they go, Mommy, Mommy, look at the lady with only one leg. Isn't she a great skier? Well, that was different. And I wasn't a great skier at all. I was laying there in the snow. I could hardly even push myself up. But I decided that skiing was a sport for me. It was something that I wanted to learn. And eventually I did get a lift ticket. And I wore it proudly to school, I will tell you that much. And I eventually got so that I could make one turn after another, and I could almost do runs without falling. Even though I was really good at it, my goal was to not fall during a run. And about that time, I received another call from Jan, and she says to me, Ronnie, would you like to enter your first ski race? And I said to her, I go, Jan, I don't know if I'm good enough to enter a ski race. I can barely make a run without falling. And she says, oh, don't worry about it. You'll be in a class with all bad skiers, so you'll fit right in. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, if that's true, I'm in. So I went up to Snoqualmie Summit, which is east of the Seattle area, and I entered my first disabled regional ski race. And when I got up there, it was really cool because there were people there of all different disabilities. There were a lot of one-legged skiers, just like myself. There were people there with no legs. There were people there with one arm, with no arms. There were paralyzed people there who, who skied in what we called mono skis. There were blind skiers. Now, I want you to close your eyes for just a minute and imagine skiing down the hill, and the only thing that you have to tell you where to go is somebody else skiing beside you or in front of you or in back of you, hollering out, turn left, turn right, turn left. Can you even imagine what that would be like? And here I am thrust into this world of all these people. And lo and behold, I must have been the best of the, of the bad skiers because after two days of racing, I won two gold medals. I beat them because I didn't fall down. These medals were like this big, right? That includes the ribbon part of it. So you like had to have your magnifying glass out 
to see them, and I'm pretty sure they weren't even made out of metal at all. But it was like the first award I had ever received for an athletic endeavor, and I decided I was still looking, you know, even after Jesus met with me. That worth thing was still so important. And those medals represented some kind of value that I had. And I decided that I was going to become a ski racer. And I was going to pursue it with everything I had. That someday I was going to become a member of the U.S. Disabled Ski Team. And I was going to go on and ski in the Olympics. I was in college at the time. And when I graduated from college with a degree in business administration, I packed up my car as full as I could possibly pack it. And I drove 22 hours to Winter Park, Colorado, where I began to train with a disabled racing program. And everybody in this program was very serious athletes. All of them were missing body parts or had body parts that didn't work anymore. And we were all striving for the same thing, and that was to become elite athletes and ski and win in races. And I remember getting there, and every single race I came in last place as I was the new kid on the block. And I was skiing against some of the greatest skiers in the United States and coming in last. And I realized at the time that I had to train not just my body, because that came easily in the every day. We were skiing gates, we were lifting weights, we were out running and getting asked for rides. And <laughs> training the body, but it was training the mind that was just as important. It's an ongoing journey to learn this thing called love and self-acceptance and to see my value the way that Jesus sees my value. And once I began to work on the mind and the body, I began to move up in the ranks. And instead of coming in last, I began to come in the middle of the pack. And pretty soon I began to kind of be in the medals. And then pretty soon I began to win some medals here and there. And I'll never forget the day when Homer Jennings, he was the head coach of the U.S. Disabled Ski Team, when he walked up to me and he hands me this jacket. And it's one of those slippery fabric, right? When you rub your arms together, it just makes all kinds of noise, puffy. And it was covered in patches. And one of the patches said U.S. Disabled Ski Team. And he handed me the jacket. And he invited me to become a member of the team. Isn't it amazing when God's plan, <laughs> when God's works are displayed in our lives, we never know what it's going to look like. But I can almost promise to you that it will look beyond anything you could have imagined. And the beautiful thing about it, it was all because I had one leg and not in spite of it. Now, my first really big race was the 1990 World Disabled Ski Championships. And it was held in Winter Park, Colorado. And I was actually training in Winter Park, Colorado. So when Homer invited me to become one of the teammates that was going to compete in this event, this is what he said to me. You know, Ronnie, we're going to take you along with us because it doesn't cost us anything to get you there. <laughs> but, well, thank you for your faith in me. He says, well, yeah, we're not expecting anything out of you for this race. We just want you to go and get the experience. And I was like, yo, thanks, that's great, vote of confidence. Funny thing happened, though. I ended up winning two silver medals in this race. And it was such an exciting time. And I got my picture on the cover of a magazine because the people came in that day and they, they had this magazine. It was called Listen. And they went to my coaches and they says, who is the most clean cut person on your team? And in unison, all the coaches were like, Ronnie. So I ended up getting my cover, my picture on this cover. Now, Listen Magazine, you've all seen it in the grocery store checkout line, right? It's really famous. <laughs> okay, it's a magazine cover, right? I mean, I was excited about it. And again, I never even dreamed it was possible. And I know I'm fast-forwarding over so much that went on during this whole period of my ski racing. It was beyond anything I could have imagined. It was beyond anything I could have hoped for. And it was pretty much the fulfillment of this crazy, ridiculous dream. You see, because God saw that dream, perhaps even put it there in the first place. And then he created everything to work out in such a way that it actually happened. And I remember the morning of being at the starting gate in 1992 in Albertville, France, in the Paralympics. I had on the full face helmet, and I was at the start looking down 
All I could hear was my own breathing because of the face cover. And it was kind of like Darth Vader breathing, like, <sighs> I was focused, not just on the first gate or the second gate, but picturing the entire race in front of me. And I remember being in that starting gate thinking, Jesus, I want to give you all the glory today. Regardless of the outcome of this race, I want to cross that finish line knowing that I have honored you, allowed your works to be displayed through me so that all the glory goes to you, whatever happens. And I pushed off on the start. And every second of that run, I felt like I was completely out of control, like at any minute I was going to blow out of the course and wipe out and not even finish. But somehow I managed to hang on to it and cross the finish line to the cheers of all the crowd that was gathered behind the fencing. And I turned around and I looked up at the time and it flashed and they put my name in first place. And on that day, I won my gold medal in the 1992 Paralympics. <laughs> and I understand that life is not just winning medals and skiing in really big races. And I understand that God's called me to do things and he's called you to do other things. And the way he displays his works in me may be completely different than the way he displays his works in you. I had a verse that I used to hang on to a lot when I was a ski racer. It's Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That was like my superhero verse. I thought, wow, I can just leap tall buildings in a single bound, win ski races. And um, I was always, when I was younger, you know, trying to prove that I could do everything anybody else could do, and this verse supported that. And then I read back a couple verses before that to get what I believe is the true impact or true meaning of this verse. Paul writes in Philippians 4, 11 through 12, he says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then he goes on to say, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You see, this, there's this sweet spot of being where Jesus wants us to be. There's this beautiful place. Oftentimes, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are going on around us. It's being available to be used by God. It's coming to the place in our lives where we, we say to him, thank you, Jesus, for making me the way that I am. Your artwork is beautiful. It's priceless. And here I am, available for your works to be displayed through me. That's the being able to do all things through Christ, part of it. And I don't know what you brought in here with you today. Some of you may be sitting there struggling with that one thing that you feel God has cursed you with. And it's something you can't take away. And so you feel like you are just stuck with it. And maybe you cry out to him and you get angry. Why did you make me like this, God? And I don't think it's any accident that you walked in these doors today. And my prayer for you is that you... Look at the beautiful tapestry of your life that he designed you to be and the plan that he has for you, not in spite of it, but because of it. That shift in belief changes everything. When Jesus healed the blind man that day, it changed his life forever. Healing can look so many different ways. And Jesus is waiting to heal you this morning. People ask me sometimes, what would you do if somebody walked up to you and offered you two perfectly good legs? And I always kind of laugh at this, this question. And, um, 
At one point in time, I probably would have taken it, right? That'd be great. That's what I prayed for as a kid. But now at 53 years old, I have seen time and time again all of the wonderful things that I have experienced in my life because of having one leg. And I would not trade that for anything. There's a song that I've sung in my mind as my theme song, and I'm going to share just a little chorus with you this morning. It goes like this. And if I had my way, I might have been wading through the river when you wanted me to walk upon the sea. And if I had my say, and all of my wants and whims and wishes, you knew how weak, how shallow I would be. I trust your wisdom over mine, because you've proven over time that in my narrow way of seeing things, I leave the best behind sometimes. I might not have stayed as close if I had had my way. Let's pray. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you today with open hearts. And I pray for each person here that they will know how much you love them, that you created them because you love them just the way that they are. And that in that love, you've got this beautiful plan laid out. And you are going to display your works through them. I thank you for allowing me to be here today, sharing my story so that once again, your works can be displayed through me. I love you, Jesus. Praise your holy name. And we give all the glory to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you so much.